We have um, a very challenging situation when we're talking about the older man, because when we think about an older man, we often think of a frail older man. Sometimes we forget that many older men are perfectly healthy, but if we recognize a very healthy older man, we should also recognize that potentially our intervention could make them frail. So we do need to be rather careful. Now a consequence of this is often we're rather outside our comfort zone as surgeons, because we know perfectly well the importance of assessing underlying mechanisms in lower urinary tract symptoms, whether benign prostate obstruction or detrusor underactivity is causing voiding problems. In storage LUTs, we know that excessive caffeine intake is relevant, that there could be inflammatory cause, it could be OAB. But when we come to other aspects, we have to extend our medical knowledge, rather. Because when it comes to nocturia, we have potentially to manage systemic causes, like cardiovascular disease, or renal dysfunction, endocrine disorders, sleep disturbances. The psychological aspects, some of us are quite considerate at listening and picking up underlying anxiety about cancer, or depression, or unrealistic expectations. Some of us are less able to do this. And our knowledge of comorbidity and polypharmacy is limited. And then, of course, the capacity of a frail older person with cognitive dysfunction to make decisions about their management and care is an extremely important aspect of managing the older person. So we can exemplify this perhaps with diabetes. It's very clear that diabetes will influence lower urinary tract function and will also influence fluid shifts. And we can easily assume that the sugar levels will influence the urinary behavior. But are we the right people to really take on the management of the sugar levels? And then when the sugar levels are optimized and that patient comes back, well, frustratingly, we often find that the lower urinary tract symptoms are actually no different. This is quite a helpful aspect of things as well, because heart failure, cardiovascular disease, is an extremely important consideration in the older individual, recognizing just how prevalent heart disease and lower urinary tract symptoms are, and hence the coincidence of the two, which we must factor when managing an individual. So there's quite a detailed algorithm which sets out how to interpret the situation for an individual. And I put this up not in the expectation that we'll pe people will read and learn it at this short notice, but rather to emphasize that we have to have a multidisciplinary approach in managing these patients. Surgeons alone cannot take on the comprehensive detailed evaluation of an older man in all his comorbid spectacular diseases and get it right each time. So the fifth international consultation on incontinence reviewed the management of frail older people and this was chaired by Adrian Wagg. And it's a very useful approach, logical, stepwise, starting with the conservative approach, lifestyle interventions, behavioral therapies, considering a trial of anti-muscarinic drugs, considering constipation as a treatable contributor, reviewing medications, considering alpha blockers, thinking of catheterization. These are all absolutely fundamental. And of course, again, the multidisciplinary the contribution of our nursing colleagues in achieving this to its best potential is profound. 
The algorithm very much emphasizes individualizing treatment and making sure that goals are set and hopefully met, recognizing our limitations that containment may realistically be the only genuine option, initiating at the conservative and behavioral level, adding in anti-muscarinics is a legitimate possibility once done cautiously, making sure that any drug started, it's the lowest possible dose that started with regular review to ensure that problems don't result. Of course, desmopressin, this is thought to be really very unsafe in the older individual. Men and women, but particularly women, are at risk of hyponatremia. So medication review, well, have a few triggers. Diuretics, obviously, are extremely relevant. Many drugs can have a diuretic effect. That would include steroids and tetracycline and lithium. Lithium is particularly problematic. And there are others, all of which should trigger our response to highlight whether the responsible health professional could alter that drug in some way, switch to something with a different mechanism of action. Now, ultimately, mere age does not exclude men from treatment. And so we can still follow, in the appropriate older man, the recommended guidance. And the EAU guidelines, which Matthias Olka set out for treatment, is logical and sensible and applicable. Focusing on nocturnal polyuria, if that's the one cause, focus on that. If storage symptoms are present, muscarinic antagonists may well be appropriate. With voiding symptoms also present, alpha blocker, 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, perhaps PDE5 inhibition, these all make good sense, as with any other man. But when using medicines, let's start with the medication review. Be aware that drug interactions or prior conditions may restrict our treatment options. Recognizing the importance of polypharmacy and also considering that adverse effects are potentially more likely in the older. And the three C's of constipation, cardiovascular, and cognition should be really thought through. And, of course, retention. Now, there is a lot of debate about anti-muscarinics use in men, and particularly elderly men, and seemingly conflicting evidence. So in this study, it was uh, recognized just how many people were using a bladder anti-muscarinic. Now that is a term that's worth paying attention to. This is the sort of drugs that as urologists and allied professionals we're used to prescribing. But many other drugs have anti-muscarinic effect that are not aimed at the bladder. And this would include steroids, various analgesics, and a wide range of medications, all of which add to the anti-muscarinic load. But about 10% of older people may be on a bladder anti-muscarinic. And it can be very useful in managing symptoms, but it can also cause problems. And potentially, you can see very profound adverse effects, such as a fall leading to fracture. And in this study, it was felt that the number needed to treat to get benefit was pretty similar to the number needed to treat to get harm. And that's quite a consideration when starting drugs in the older individuals. The cognitive impact of anti-muscarinic medications is implied by the fact that M1 receptors in the brain are important in cognition. So again, Adrian, who does seem to be a very active chap, undertook a study comparing oxybutynin, solifenicid, and placebo and its potential cognitive impact, indicating that there are potential implications with anti-muscarinic use, 
and some differences potentially between the drugs that we have available for prescription. The newer introduction of a beta-3 agonist is very important when we consider the fact that cardiovascular disease is common in older men. Could the beta-3 agonist alter the cardiovascular morbidity? Now, this study suggests that adding in myribagron on top of an alpha blocker doesn't really have any great impact on the cardiovascular function of the older man. But nonetheless, we need more studies in order to really establish what's the true case for the older man. Surgery is not inappropriate in carefully selected older men. And the phrasing is nicely put in the fifth consultation on incontinence that age per se is not a contraindication to surgery. It is suitable to precede any surgical decision with an appropriate trial of conservative therapy, talked through potential benefits and risks, and make sure, of course, the potential elderly risk factors such as the risk of post-operative delirium, infection, dehydration, and falls are suitably considered and managed. If that's the case, then surgery can be considered. And of course, procedures to relieve voiding problems such as standard TURP, laser resection, laser enucleation, and the altern alternatives remain a possibility in those that are medically fit. Now we're starting to see some options that have an appeal when thinking of the older person. For example, prostate artery embolization is an interventional radiology procedure rather than a surgical one. And that has attraction because it avoids the anesthetic aspects and prolonged hospital stay is prevented. So we hope that we will be able to see a sustained, proven benefit with this sort of intervention, and it's looking quite promising on initial publications. Another relatively non-invasive and less risky evident uh, procedure would be the Eurolift procedure in which a clip is used to retract the prostatic lobes laterally. And this quite nice study followed people with a sort of randomized sham element to the structure and was able to demonstrate significant benefits in terms of IPSS total score and maximum flow rate. And because of its less invasive and less risky introduction compared with a prostatic resection, this has, of course, some appeal for the older man. we do continue to use surgical intervention in older men. And the population studies that we often see from Finland, again, have looked at this sort of study and did find that even in the older age groups, prostate surgery is quite commonly undertaken and seems to carry, when suitably selected, minimal risk of adverse effects over and above the healthy younger population. So when thinking about LUTs in the older man, we have to be very conscious of the implications of wider health, polypharmacy, and multiple comorbidities. These have to be treated with substantial respect and consideration given to the fact that our interventions may make someone that is currently healthy into a frail man. But nonetheless, when suitably selected, and carefully managed in conjunction with our allied professionals and multidisciplinary colleagues, we can still use the full range of treatments, except perhaps desmopressin. We can still use those even in the very old patients and have a realistic chance of helping the issues. So let's work together not to overlook the older man as an important patient group. Thank you.